I'm honored to be here. So excited to be here. Um, I, I know it's a commission on the status of women, and I am a man, so thank you for allowing me to be. Um, however, I will take a daughter slant, and I like to give a little bit of female credibility. I have four sisters, three daughters, 90% of my students are female, and a wife and a mother. So I, I'm, I'm pretty much surrounded by females all the time, and I'm thankful for that. Um, there's so much I could talk about the father-daughter relationship that I don't have time to share at all. So if you have questions afterwards, you're welcome to ask. Um, I can point you to resources, but I'm going to give you just maybe a somewhat certainly abbreviated point on the father-daughter relationship um, and its remarkable potential, especially to empower women. I know this is gender equality and women empowerment, and boy, super uh, superheroes can come in the forms of dads when it comes to empowerment. And then the women can become their own superhero. So let me give you a few disclaimers out of the gates. Number one, um, anybody who understands social science realizes that correlation does not equal causation. Just because the rooster crows every time the sun comes up does not mean the rooster is causing the sun to come up. And a lot of the ideas I hear at the Commission on the Status of Women, unfortunately, are looking for that causality and they're finding the wrong source. So metaphorically speaking, I hear a lot of ideas of, well, let's just kill the rooster and then the sun won't come up anymore. And I think we're, well, I know we're grossly missing a lot of points to solve a lot of issues in this world, because it's not the rooster. Uh, another disclaimer, there are powerful women who have been raised in single parent households with just their mother. And they've been able to overcome a lot of difficulty, and that's perhaps the source of their strength. So this is not to discount that. Um, motherhood is, I believe, high and holy, and I um, would love to talk about that if, if that were the topic today, but I'm focusing on fathers. So this is no way to disparage mothers by any means. And then lastly, um, not every girl who's raised in a, a home with an active father is guaranteed to be empowered and to be problem-free. We live in a world that's full of problems. That's just the reality of this life. So. There's some of my disclaimers. I can give you a lot more, but who wants to hear more disclaimers? All right. So you may be wondering at the Commission on the Status of Women, why should I listen to a guy, or as they say in the United States, listen to a dude? Um, why should you care about that? Maybe in your own country. Why does fatherhood even matter, especially for women empowerment? Um, well, let me give you a quote that I read from Rolling Stone magazine, and I'm going to throw a lot of disclaimers. I'm not an avid Rolling Stone magazine reader. In fact, I think this was sent to me by somebody who knows that I like to study and speak on fatherhood. They're like, you should check out this quote. So, Katy Perry, who's a popular icon, uh, singer in the United States, and I would say throughout the world, and a lot of girls, especially between the ages of about 8 to 14, really emulate these uh, and follow these type of uh, women. She happened to say in the magazine, I don't need a dude to have children, it's 2014. I love the claim. Every time someone says it's and they're saying the year, it's 2017, it's 2000. That usually means history is dumb and we're smarter now. And there's usually very little evidence to back up that statement. So um, it's 2014. I don't need a dude. And then she goes on to say, we are living in the future. I'm not anti-men. I love men. But there's an option if someone doesn't present himself. Um, Apologize if this sounds a little overbearing. I think that's an extremely selfish statement because if I want children almost like it's a pet, I can bring them into the world through artificial insemination or through other scientific advancements, um, which can be used for good if harnessed the right way. I'm here to refute that claim, and if Katie were standing here and said, let me share you some evidence. Um, before I get to the evidence to refute why the girl, if she ends up having a girl, why you might want to be interested, Katie, and her dad being involved in her life. As I said, I'm a father. I have a son who we will not talk about right now because of the Commission on the Status of Women. He doesn't matter right now. <laughs> no, I love him. He's going to be 14 this year, Carter, and then my beautiful wife, Jody, of 17, almost 17 years. And then Molly, who's 10. Naomi, there in the middle, who is 8. And then Eleanor, we call her Nora or Norzy Porzy. And we've got a, I've got a lot of nicknames. I won't get into all nicknames. Eleanor will be six in about two weeks. 
Um, Eleanor will be coming, my family will be coming with me to uh, DC to do a sabbatical this fall, and we're going to come up to New York. And Eleanor's favorite thing, most exciting thing about New York is she wants to see taxis. <laughs> I think you're going to get burned out after 10 minutes, Eleanor. Um, so, because Katie made that claim, Katy Perry, I have boom, boom, boom of uh, reasons that I want to share why that statement um, was not only selfish, but very misguided and misinformed. And I'm worried that those kind of statements are going to inform other future moms and dads about the lack of necessity. I would also say, Katie, tell these girls that they don't need the dude that they call dad. This is Eleanor making her, if I make this face, you'll give me whatever I want face. So, and it usually works. <laughs> um, okay, now, there are a lot of different opinions at CSW. Here is, um, I don't know whether to call her Emma Watson or Mighty Granger or Bell, but she's all three, and she's going to, as the UN Goodwill Ambassador, she has something to say about some of the opinions here. Today, we are launching a campaign called He for She. I am reaching out to you because we need your help. We want to end gender inequality, and to do this, we need everyone involved. This is the first campaign that's kind at the UN. We want to try and galvanize as many men and boys as possible to be advocates for change. And we don't just want to talk about it. We want to try and make sure that it's tangible. I was appointed as Goodwill Ambassador for UN Women six months ago. And the more I've spoken about feminism, the more I have realized that fighting for women's rights has too often become synonymous with man-hating. If there is one thing I know for certain, it is that this has to stop. And I echo that sentiment, especially if we want to empower, uh, both genders need each other to be able to empower each other. Um, let me give you a little bit more information on that. Okay, so this is a perspective of nearly a thousand fathers that were representative sample in the United States. And I think you can see a somewhat similar trend throughout the world. So they were asked questions such as how much they agree with it. There is a father absence crisis in the United States. 91% of them agreed with that statement. Um, also, all else being equal, men perform best as fathers if they are married to the mothers of their children. 81% agreed with that statement. The government should do more to help and support fathers. 67% agreed with that statement. Being a father is very important, part of who you are. 99% agreed with that statement. I think that's quite significant. We can't ignore that. The media, commercials, and TV shows tend to portray fathers as in a negative light. Well over half, about two-thirds, agreed with that statement. I would agree with that as well. You are inspired to be a better dad when you see and or hear advertisement, media, and media featuring good fathers. Notice almost the same percentage. So they actually are inspired. We, even the dads who may be rough and tough, they're still inspired by the media. Um, you aren't terribly necessary or even important in your daughter's life. About a third have picked up on the cultural mentality that you're really not that relevant, that somebody else can take your place. Or maybe Katy Perry was right. So, this is to summarize Marsh's sentiments on family capital. The, the preeminent uh, psychologist and sociologist Yuri Bronkenbrenner said the family is the most powerful, the most humane, and by far the most economical <coughs> system known for building competence and character. Not the educational system, not the government, not the UN, not the stuff at the federal level. The family is the best way to build competence and character. And boy, are we lacking both of those in our society today. Again, think of the rooster and the sun. And what we are assuming, why we're lacking character, must be because of some totally arbitrary reason or ambiguous reason. Um, here's a statement about fathers. It's very easy for a man to father a child. To father a child, unlike the mother a child, typically refers to a biological act. And men do, not to, to, uh, men do not seem to have much of a problem in that regard. To be a father, rather than merely to father, means to give a child guidance, instruction, encouragement, care, and love. 
Or as Marsha mentioned, selflessness. Put off yourself. Put off your desires to just focus on whatever the heck you want. Um, fatherhood, the state of being a father is declining to a remarkable degree because so many fathers no longer with their biological children. That's from Professor Popeno at Rutgers University. Well, if you don't believe me, let me give you some statistics. Over 24 million children are now growing up in homes in the United States in uh, biological father absent homes. By the way, this is a trend that, has, that hasn't always existed. If you look back in 1960, nine in 10 children resided with, their, resided with their two married parents. So I like to say, again, let's get the rooster off the table and let's talk about, and I, I, this is one of the things that can frustrate me about going to events at CSW. There's so many factors and variables that are not being considered. That how we got to the point where we're at. And I'm going to explore some of those now, but I'm going to just say that we've got to broaden our lens instead of getting so focused on one injustice or one problem and then projecting that, assuming that's the problem everywhere. We're just, we don't solve problems that way um, in a home, let alone in society. So um, this is, all, I think, also been hit on. So I'm going to talk about the ripple effect of absentee dads, and it extends not just in a culture but throughout society and throughout generations, so it can disrupt that. I think the biggest problem we see is a disruption of connection, because we all innate, we were uh, wired to connect. We have plenty of attachment research and theory to support that, that if you are not connected, then um, you're going to find some sort of other thing to connect that, whether that is pornography, whether that's being a shopaholic, whether that's just endlessly checking your smartphone, we're always going to find something that will give us that sense of connection if we don't get that from the place that nature um, was ordered toward. And you can see that everywhere. When people do not feel connected or wanted a sense of belongingness, they will find some artificial or temporary replacement. And that's how a lot of addictions happen. So, fatherless children who grow up in fatherless homes compared to other homes that have involved father, they're four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen, they're more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to face abuse and neglect, two times greater risk of infant mortality, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to go to prison, two times more likely to suffer obesity, more likely to commit crime, and two times more likely to drop out of high school. Now if you want to empower women, make sure they're educated, they're not committing crime, that they're um, involved mothers, that are responsible with their sexuality and, and are empowered by that. That they're healthy. If you're not empowered, if you're not healthy, you're actually dependent on your health problems and you have to constantly go to pills or medicine, which can be a great blessing. Um, this is, to me is disempowering people when all these problems arise. So, now that I've depressed you enough, let's just get more specific about the, the unique Father, actually, I'm not going to depress you. I, I, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to give you some more. So what's unique about the father-daughter relationship? Again, from Professor Popano, should we, we should disavow the notion that mommies can make good daddies, just as we should disavow the popular notion that daddies can make good mommies. The two sexes are different to the core, and each is necessary culturally and biologically for the optimal development of a human being. There is uh, loads of neurological research, biological research, sociological, psychological research. So men and women, actually, their eye structure is different. Their brains are different. From birth, they see things differently, and they've actually tested this. It's A lot of the studies can be found in the book Why Gender Matters from Leonard Sachs. Speaking of, oh, well, he has something to say about it. There is more at stake than the old question of nature versus nurture. The failure to recognize and respect sex differences in child development has done substantial harm over the past 30 years. The gender of the parent matters to the gender of the child. Mothers influence sons differently than they influence daughters. Fathers influence daughters differently than they influence sons, and so forth. Oh, and, and it, it, my daughters actually influence me differently than my son does. I think my, uh, well, I won't tell you how that works, because then I'll go off on tangents of stories. Okay, uh, Linda Nielsen, who I think is the foremost researcher in this country on father-daughter relationships, she's a professor of women's studies at Wake Forest, happens to say, True, most fathers and mothers relate differently to their kids, but why would we want them to be identical? That's one of the benefits of being raised by a mom and a dad. They don't always do things the same way, but this doesn't mean that one parent is inferior to the other. We're not doing father-daughter relationships any good, and we're being sexist when we assume that dad's ways of parenting are inferior to mom's because he's a man. 
I, pardon the sports analogy, but are we going to say that the point guard is now inferior to the center because in basketball, because he doesn't bring because he brings the ball to the floor and he doesn't he's not tall and he doesn't post up or vice versa. They both have critical roles even though they have different skill sets and both of them have to work together and maximize the ability that they do have so the team can actually win and progress and do well together. But if the center says, hey, I want to bring the ball up the floor, dang it, that's not fair, then the team's probably going to struggle because he's not really a ball handler and, and uh, same with the point guard. Okay, that's, sorry, I'm jumping off the sports analogy for a moment. Okay, so let me give you some more data and I promise we'll get into something that's a little bit more um, tangible here, but daughters who have a loving, respectful, active relationship with their fathers while they were growing up often have the advantage over other daughters in many areas. Let me give you some here. They're not overly dependent on men. They're not abusing drugs and alcohol. They're not being imprisoned. They are being, being successful. Uh, they're being successful at school and at work. We'll talk about the empowerment there too. Not being raped or sexually abused. There's more empowerment, not developing an eating disorder. Um, dealing well with those in authority, especially men. Being secure and self-confident. I, I just don't see how you don't see empowerment in, in, interwoven in every single one of those. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not going to read through all these, but here's even more areas that fathers have a greater impact on girls. If you want these, you can get these later. If you want to take a picture, take it now. But... Um, look at the bottom one. Motivate daughters to reach their full potential. Sorry, no more pictures, please. Okay, um, here's another one. 35% of girls in the United States whose fathers left before age six became pregnant as teenagers. By contrast, only 5% of girls whose fathers stayed with them throughout childhood became pregnant as teenagers. What does that mean for economic impact? And what does that mean for empowerment in our society? Well. Um, Two-thirds of young unmarried mothers are poor and around 25% go on welfare within the years of childbirth. So you can start to see the ripple effect here. Um, <coughs> girls who grow up in father-absent homes more likely to have um, babies out of wedlock, more likely to have babies as teenagers, which means they're more likely to be poor and more likely relying on government programs. Um, Low educational attainment among teen mothers affects their economic opportunities and earnings in later years. They're much less likely to finish high school or even go to college. Doesn't mean they can't. We just want to promote the uh, what's the most likely, what's the best scenario. Okay, Lynn Nielsen also says this, the father has the greater impact on the daughter's ability to trust, enjoy, and relate to the males in her life. So the foundation of all male relationships for a woman is found in the father. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be filled in other ways by other father figures, but the data is pretty darn clear on this. And I'll give you just a few examples of that. This is from one girl who was interviewed in a study. She said, my dad never compliments me about how I look. I wish he would, especially during times when I have no boyfriend. Even at my school dance, when I was dressed up like a bride, he never once told me I looked pretty. Um, let me give you a little more data to back that up. They're less likely to become sexually exploited at a young age because if that void is there, dad was not involved, they're going to seek other attention. I, I spoke with someone who was a, a woman who was a stripper and she was in the porn industry for a while as an actress and she got out. And she said she had the realization that she danced for men as an adult because when she tried to dance for her father as a three, four, five year old girl, in a pretty dress, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so she's still trying to get that attention, that love, and that connection today. But she's doing it in unhealthy ways. And she didn't realize this until after being had the being exploited quite a bit. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to end up that way, but those are some examples. More likely to forge healthy relationships with men. Uh, far more likely to develop healthier view of intimacy and sexuality. Here's another one. She said, my dad has always been distant, and my mom is clinically depressed, so I prefer random one-night stands with no attachment involved. Why? Because it's too painful. I pick guys I feel superior to and can control. I don't trust people, especially men. I close up emotionally and never want to depend on men for anything. 
because she couldn't when she was younger. So now, the very thing she needed, now she hates them or uses them for her own advantage. I'll just give you three quick stories of women from, who were in the, um, the actresses in the porn industry, if you want to call it, and, and they got out. Here's what they had to say in their stories. I loved the attention from everyone, but now I look back, that's not the kind of attention I needed. By the way, everyone I've studied, I did a qualitative analysis of all of the women who've gotten out and shared their story. Everyone comes from broken families. Everyone comes from a cold, absent, abusive, or abusive father. Every single one, they all said, I loved the attention. That phrase is repeated again and again and again. That's not empowerment. That's disempowerment. For so many years, I felt no one could truly love me. I felt that I was trapped in depression and self-loathing and that I was a hopeless case. I was going to get the attention I always loved and wanted. I loved and craved attention. Let's skip down to, I was desperate for love, and then her final statement is, I loved the attention, and by then I was jaded and used to the whole porn world. I learned to depend on men to take care of me. I wanted a father so much. Okay, so what does it mean to exploit somebody rather than to empower? Well, exploit could be make full use of and derive benefit from a resource, which is what's happening to some women today. Use a situation or person in an unfair and selfish way. Um, I'm just, I'm sorry I'm flying through this, but short on time, and I want to make sure that you get this. By the way, an FBI agent was once asked about how he found his victims, and, and he was incarcerated sex, sorry, the FBI agent asked the incarcerated sex trafficker how he found his young victims. Who kind of messed that one up? The pimp explained, it's easy, I see a girl at the mall, I go up to her and say, you have beautiful eyes, and she smiles and says, thanks, I leave her alone, but if she looks down and says, no, I don't, I know I've got her. Um, I've created a spectrum. What we see here, an unhealthy spectrum of, um, in the research, we see either a mistrust and avoidance of men or a repulsion to men and using them to their own advantage or an overly unhealthy trust and reliance on, which anywhere on that spectrum is not healthy, which is why it's called an unhealthy spectrum. And that's not empowerment. Um, I think John Mayer summarized it quite well, and I'll let him give you a couple lines. Father's bigger to your daughters Daughters will love like you do Girls become lovers Who tell it to mothers So mothers be good to your daughters too I don't know if he was reading the research at the time or what, but he Boy, and he actually won a Grammy for this. Thank heavens, I think when you win Grammys for something, we're saying something about our culture, the fatherhood matters, for heaven's sake. Um, okay, in summary, fathers have been found to have a greater impact on than mothers in all these areas. Look at the empowerment of not having to rely on something external, whether it's a man, it's a dollar, or it's something else, that they can go and now act for themselves and be autonomous individuals. Um, let me just give you a couple quick suggestions and then I'll wrap up. Here's um, a model that dads can follow that you can implement into community programs and maybe even at the, the policy and law level, we can do that. Father's character matters. Uh, who he is. Do what I do and who I am more than just, uh, this, is, this is why it's the foundational piece. Then the relationship with mom. If mom, if they are married, then the best way daughters can learn is how dad loves mom and how he expresses that. <laughs> I like to um, randomly just kiss my wife in the kitchen, not only because I like it, but I want my kids to see that mom and dad love each other. Some, and two kids are grossed out, and two go, kiss again! So, I, I'm going to do it anyway. So, um, if they are not married, this still can apply because the research on divorce shows you can minimize, you can't eradicate, but you can minimize the negative effects of divorce on a children by having a good relationship with the mother of your children, by not having a warlike relationship, not hating each other, not bagging on each other behind each other's backs. So this still matters. Father-daughter relationship, what is, and I have something that looks at each, what it might look like. You need a real trustworthy and loving father. There needs to be affection here. There needs to be love and respect between the two. Father-daughter relationship, there also needs to be affection. So dads have to, if there's any awkwardness from the, group, the home they grew up in, they've got to learn to get over that and be affectionate with their daughters. Daddy-daughter dates are a great idea. We're, no matter what your country is, you can go out and just spend one-on-one -on -one time with each daughter and get to know her and get to know her world. 
Listen and learn from her. Coach her through her emotions. Understand her emotions. Teach her about boys, intimacy, body image, education, and career. And then when you have to correct, use guidance and patience. Don't try to control her. Because that's dad's reaction. We want to protect them. And that's okay, but it's got to be channeled through guidance and patience. Um, on this side, you can have an anti-man or anti-dad culture that tries to dismantle this whole thing. So I think we have enough good materials that we can get out in the communities and have dads, whether they're um, affluent, poor, uneducated, divorced, married, the data shows that you can educate dads and they start to step it up more. Here's one example of a dad who is trying to build a relationship with his daughter. Oh, those boys are much too much. Those boys are much too much. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We're going to beat them and bust them. The smallest moment can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I encourage you to go to fatherhood.gov. They have so many good resources, so much good data. Um, this girl is being empowered by a man who, uh, her dad, who loves her deeply, and the best thing you can give your children is your time and your attention. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is another model. I'm going to skip down here to one dad who's trying really hard to protect his daughter and his attempt to teach. I, McKenna. I, McKenna. I, McKenna. Promise. Promise. Daddy. Daddy. That I will not. That I will not. Have any boyfriends. That I will not. <laughs> have any boyfriends. Say it. Say I will not have any boyfriends. I just want to look at them though. <laughs> <laughs> In fight nature. <laughs> well, you can. Um, I know that feeling when my daughters will say, when I get married, I said, you mean when you're 40? And I'm going to pretty you for anyhow. There has to be not this overbearance, even though the father means well. Um, research in child development tells us girls are losing far more than an assistant mom. Fathers typically relate to children differently than mothers, which means their involvement leads to the development of different competencies and empowerment, I would add, particularly in the areas of social relationships. Um, here's an example of a daddy-daughter debate, which I'm going to skip and get right down to. Um, one of the things we can do is change the marriage culture, bring it back. I think marriage is now, especially amongst millennials and the rising generation, have, um, it has gone the way of the dodo bird. We can bring the marriage culture back. back. Um, research shows that when you get fathers involved, and even if you have community level um, education for fathers, they can learn how to step it up. And then finally, I will leave you with this um, this quote here. When dads who did not have great relationships with their fathers find freedom in pain and pain from pain um, and resulting issues of the past, the next generation, our daughters, are strengthened. We give them a gift that will produce the kind of legacy we wish for every girl. <laughs> That is what halts and even reverses the staggering statistics of father absence. This is the path to the healing of the next generation in our society. As fathers, we must heal our own wounded hearts to fully enjoy and raise our girls well. Indeed, girls can have a very healing effect on their dads. I know that personally. I know that um, the media and popular ideologists teach false messages about love, connection, empowerment, and happiness. And this relationship that we're talking about actually teaches the truth about each one of those. This is the relationship here. My daughter illustrated that on a picture, the two of us dancing together. Um, and then my daughter and I had a daddy-daughter dance. I know that this is possible. It will take time, just as antibiotics take time to heal the bacteria inside of us. This is not a cough medicine fix. But if we're patient and persistent and we look at it through a different lens, we can certainly change. Uh, the world through these types of approaches. Thank you very much.